firstly, thank you all very much for, for joining us today. It's a pleasure um, to speak with you. My name is Jack McQuibbon. I'm the Cities Programme Coordinator here at Zero Waste Europe. And today's webinar, excitingly, is the start of our new series, the Zero Waste Europe Live Webinar Series. And we're going to be really looking into the, the crux of what a, a zero waste city is. And we have two really esteemed panelists um, joining us today. Um, so thank you all very much for joining. The Zero Waste Europe Live webinar series that we conduct um, brings together experts to discuss critical themes, policies, and strategies and trends surrounding uh, zero waste and circular economy worldwide today. Um, so a bit of information for Zero Waste on Zero Waste Europe for those who may not be familiar. We are a Brussels-based NGO here in Europe. Um, we have 31 members in 24 countries across Europe inside and outside of the European Union and we're really working towards uh, the vision of a European society that, um, that sort of protects that, um, the, the value of resources and keeps them within the circular economy here, um, reducing, preventing waste and sort of ensuring that no harmful chemicals uh, released sent to landfill or burned away um, into the environment that will harm human health. So, Yes, today's webinar, <clears throat> like I said, it's going to be on what is a zero waste city. Here at Zero Waste Europe, we work with nearly 400 municipalities across Europe who have committed to becoming zero waste. Um, our role is to not only push for ambitious waste legislation uh, in, by the European Union, but we really support grassroots, um, grassroots led local level action to implement these policies on the ground. Um, and this is really where the driving force behind Zero Waste is happening in Europe today. So we're really excited to have this webinar and, and to get into the, the sort of the, the real core of the issue about what Zero Waste is. The structure of the webinar um, will be as follows. You'll see that there are two panellists with me today. Um, there was originally going to be three, but unfortunately a third Jose Gregoric um, from Snaga, which is the waste management company in Ljubljana, um, the first zero waste capital city in Europe, uh, is sick and cannot join us today, unfortunately. So um, yes, whilst it's unfortunate event, we're excited because this means that we can delve a bit more into the presentations and the topics that Sarah and Enzo will join today, um, present on, and we can have a much more uh, interactive and longer question and answer session too. So, content of today. Cities and communities um, across Europe are at the forefront of change. We know that and we see that every day with local level leadership and action to drive the transition was a circular model of resource management. New ambitious European legislation that's been enacted recently such as the amendments to the, to the waste framework directive um, will require local authorities to accelerate the process the progress in the coming years so that prevention and reuse policies are developed, separate collection is widespread, quality recycling is the rule, and disposal in landfills and incinerators is ultimately phased out. This webinar will examine what are the key steps and pillars of a zero waste community, where are zero waste programs already being adopted, um, providing successful examples of this, and what are the barriers for zero waste programs today, and how officials overcome these constraints. So, um, as I mentioned, there are two panelists. There is um, Sarah O'Carroll, uh, the network manager from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, and Enzo Favorino, um, the chair of the scientific committee here from Zero Waste Europe. And both panelists will present for 15 to 20 minutes, and then we'll open up the floor so for a brief Q&A for 10 minutes after the first speaker, and then another Q&A after the second speaker. You'll see, um, as attendees, at the bottom of your Zoom webinar chat box, there is a Q&A function. <clears throat> to submit direct questions for the panelists, please type them into this box here. Um, but you'll also see there is a chat separate to this where um, we will be providing links and sort of further background information and context to the points that the panelists are making. Um, and in the Q&A session, uh, I will pick the, the, Q &A, the questions that are posed by this function and present them to the panelists after their presentation. Uh, finally, a special mention um, today because we have exciting uh, live connection with Vilnius Yadini Minas Technical University 
uh, in Vilnius, Lithuania, um, who are doing a live screen into this. So hello to everyone there. And special thank you to um, Demantis Chesevisius, um, the director of Zero Waste Lithuania, and as well Dr. Alsa Zygmunt Tiene. And apologies um, if I pronounced that wrong, it's my British accent, but uh, yeah, the, the head of the Faculty of Environmental Engineering at the university. So a special hello to, to you guys, and of course, uh, a big thank you for all your attendees for, for joining us today. So without further ado, let me introduce uh, Enzo as our first speaker. Um, Enzo Favorino um, is the chair of the scientific committee here at Zero Waste Europe. He's a technical expert and researcher at the, now let me get this right, Enzo, the Scuola Agri Agraria del Parco de Monza. And that's awful, I apologize. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. You have decades of experience in the separate waste collection, recycling, composting, and prevention. Enzo is an expert in EU waste legislation and is highly knowledgeable in the field of European policy making. He's one of the founders of the European Compost Network, and as I mentioned, the chair of the Scientific Committee um, of Zero Waste Europe, and also coordinator of the Scientific Committee Zero Waste Research Centre in Italy as well. So, Enzo, we're extremely excited um, to have you here. Thank you for joining us, and the floor is now yours. My pleasure and thanks uh, for inviting me to facilitate this webinar as well. Um, there's one more thing I'd like to add on top of what you said about myself. I like to define myself as we zero wasters like to define ourselves, always happy and never satisfied. Uh, zero waste is all uh, about keeping ambition, setting the bar higher and higher, uh, celebrating the results of what you have already achieved but already planned for uh, further improvements in the future. So um, I would say there are a few challenging questions. I will not sidestep because first of all, we have to discuss what is the zero waste methodology? How does it work in, uh, in cities? And uh, above all, does it deliver? What are the possible achievements? Is there anything that may be considered as best practice coming from zero waste programs, zero waste schemes, which are implemented locally? And we will address them uh, uh, in a consistent way. Uh, long story short, this is zero waste, the vision, the global role. But basically, to cut a long story short, I would say that zero waste is all about retaining the value of resources and materials in the loop. So uh, as such, it blends perfectly the vision, the spirit of circular economy. Uh, basically, with circular economy, we are shifting from the take, make, waste towards a model in which we try to keep the materials in their highest and best status for as long as possible. And as such, basically, zero waste uh, is, a, uh, is a recipe which is made of uh, many components uh, which address the different possibilities to deal with materials and resources in order to retain the value. We all love butterflies. This was borrowed by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, by the way. We have got the, the, the guest speaker today from Ellen MacArthur Foundation. This was a very successful diagram which shows whatever we may do with the biological cycle of materials and the technological cycle of materials. And zero waste basically keeps them all in the system, trying to minimize what we call the leakages of materials from the system. Basically, landfilling and incineration are both considered as leakages of materials from the system. We have already got, as you mentioned, some 400 municipalities across Europe which are already committed to a zero waste program. Uh, for the moment, we have got particular strongholds in a few countries such as Slovenia, Spain, Italy, Wales. We are moving eastward with the uh, early pilot schemes in Romania, in Bulgaria, one of the main cities in Bulgaria just adopted a formal zero waste commitment. Um, and uh, what defines a zero waste uh, municipality, a zero waste community, is to adopt a formal zero waste commitment, which has to be made of solid and verifiable, measurable operational steps, and above all, a commitment to keep improving, always happy and never satisfied, even when you are at 90%. We have got Quite a few municipalities already a 90% separate collection, but they are already planning how to get to 95 and then 96 uh, because there are still a few precious steps towards perfection. Um, this is a long story. It started back in 2007 in Capannori. Capannori is a, not a small village, a mid-sized municipality totaling 45,000 people. 
uh, in, based in Central Italy, in Tuscany, uh, near Lucca. Uh, this is uh, Rossano Ercolini. Uh, he was awarded uh, the Goldman Prize in 2013 for environmental activism, and he's the president of Zero Waste Europe, by the way. And uh, Capannori took its steps with a uh, formal commitment towards the zero waste, and ever since it has been improving, introducing curbside collections, separating the organics, introducing pay through, working on reuse centers, uh, promoting uh, reduction and prevention measures, and so on and so forth. For the moment, Capannori, you know, basically, the average production of municipal solid waste by the average European is some 500 kilograms per inhabitant in year. And Capanori today is at 65 kilograms per inhabitant in year of residual waste that's still requiring disposal. Uh, but they have also promoted a zero waste families program in order to promote zero waste lifestyles. And the families have got an average of three kilograms per inhabitant in year. So this all tells us how much spoilage of resources we still do have in our society and how much, how long we may go in our road to perfection. This is another incredible, outstanding example, our Zero Waste Champion District based in Northeastern Italy, Contarina, the province Treviso, which is totaling a population of one million inhabitants. So not as a restricted situation, not a small uh, area. Uh, it's uh, uh, 55 municipalities, and this is the reduction of uh, uh, residual waste in time, in, uh, uh, last 15 years, they are already around 50 kilograms per inhabitant in GR, but above all, they have got a midterm goal of further reducing residual waste by 80% by 2023. So they want to go down to 10 kilograms per inhabitant in GR by 2023. Uh, but how does the work program work? So how can uh, the utopia be turned into reality? Uh, basically, this is the basic Zero Waste Work program, and they, these are the cornerstones of the formal commitment we require from the Zero Waste municipalities. It has to include curbside collection, and this must include organics. The waste prevention practices, the most common and uh, uh, the low-hanging fruits that may be adopted by municipalities themselves without waiting for uh, industrial policy to reduce packaging. They may start promoting right away packaging free shops, uh, home composting, cloth nappies, washable nappies instead of the throwaway nappies, and so on and so forth. And then the financial incentives pay as you throw, promoting reuse activities and centers because there's so much added value and also the possibility to create jobs uh, also for the benefit of the local communities uh, with uh, reuse centers. And then always check composition of residual waste with waste audits in order to understand what are the mistakes in the current systems which leave, we leave behind and we don't want to leave behind. We want to uh, turn it into a feedback to industrial production in order to redesign for better reusability, durability, recyclability, and compostability. Uh, let's put some emphasis on the organics. The organics are just so fundamental both from the quantitative standpoint, because they are so fundamental to achieve highest material recovery rates. Uh, by the way, we have an obligation on separate collection of the organics as stipulated in the new waste framework directive in Europe. By 2023, all municipalities will have to separate the organics uh, for industrial composting or to manage them locally through home and community composting. But also they are important from the operational standpoint because once we capture the organics, we minimize organics in residual waste. So we may sharply reduce the collection frequency for residual waste, which leads to cost optimization of the system. And also it promotes better separation of the dry recyclables as well, paper, glass, plastics, and metals, because people will find it more user-friendly to separate than to wait for the next collection round for residual waste. This is also taking place in densely populated areas. For the moment, we have got an outstanding example with the city of Milan, totally 1.4 million people, and 100% of them already connected uh, with separate collection of organics with fruit food scraps, but also Copenhagen totaling uh, 700,000 people, Bristol 500,000 people, and Ljubljana itself, we will touch briefly upon Ljubljana in a while. Um, of course, you need to make the system user-friendly, but there are the tools, there are the 
the systems to make it user friendly, tidy, comfortable. Uh, we we may elaborate on that a little bit during the Q and A session if anybody is intrigued by that. Also, let me remark something we always bring up. These are the ethnic groups in the city of Milan. And as you can see, we have got a widespread representation of people coming from all over the world. So uh, may anybody argue that Egyptians or Chinese people or Romanians are not able to do separate collection? If they do that in Milan, they will certainly be able to do that in their homelands. And this is why the system is now moving eastwards. Uh, for instance, uh, Salach or Shalaks, because they are bilingual, they are based in the northwestern part of Romania. Uh, one of the early pilot zero waste schemes in Romania with the five streams, a very simple system covering paper and cardboard, glass, plastics and metals together because they are lightweight and compactable, organics and residual waste. In a few months, they went from basically nothing, 3% separate collection, up to 65% separate collection. So this shows the potential of zero waste programs in a much shorter time than building heavy infrastructure to reduce reliance on landfills. Se uh, separate collection, recycling, and zero waste programs do the job, really do the job. Okay, waste reduction initiatives, let's go towards the end. Never forget about promoting uh, tap water. This is good practice, which is becoming quite widespread uh, in many areas of Southern Europe, the water houses, to get people used back to using uh, tap water, because they forgot uh, there's a huge use of bottled water, which in most situations doesn't make sense at all, because tap water is perfectly uh, good in quality, drinkable, and so on. Promoting the clothes, the washable nappies, uh, I will go back to that in a while, and making the waste audits on uh, residual waste. Through the analysis of uh, residual waste, we get an outstanding amount of information on what are the next steps we have to implement, and this is the key methodological um, step iteration and improvement, continued improvement on what you do, assessing, testing, verifying what is left behind and what you need to address to, uh, 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 to uh, insert further improvement in your system. For instance, you may find out that there is an increasing amount of coffee capsules in, uh, in your system. And of course, we try to promote more a different way of brewing coffee uh, through the old mocha systems without the capsules. But we accept the challenges of modern life and in the offices they use the coffee capsules. So you may convince the coffee makers to make the coffee capsules recyclable or compostable. And we were successful in this respect. Or the nappies, the closed nappies. We wanted to convince people to use back the washable nappies Sometimes people do not want or do not have time to wash the net piece. And so we may establish some centralized washing services run by young people. So we turn the disposal cost into new jobs, new wages. And it's working, such as the lavanda system in the Bologna area, which you uh, started serving the creche schools, the kindergartens, and then they moved on to service also the families. Uh, financial incentives, pay as you throw, it may be done with comparatively complicated systems such as RFID uh, transmitters or with more simple systems, prepaid bags. Uh, some may think wrongly that if you implement a pay as you throw system, much of the waste will end up in the woods or in the countryside, uh, which is, we don't have such evidence. Actually, if the system is designed the proper way, with, in particular with the proper combination of, of the fixed parts in the waste tax and the variable part of the fee, the system will capture all the recyclables and compostables. You can see the city of Parma, a, Z, a formal zero waste committed city. Uh, through uh, payers is through, they reduced the residual waste by 56% in as little as four years. 
And basically, they increased compostables and recyclables by 40% garden waste, 99% organic waste, 39% lightweight packaging, and so on and so forth. So good practice is becoming widespread. If you are wonder how diffused are such uh, situations, uh, this is something you can see from, uh, uh, from this uh, list of municipalities above 70%, 80%, and even more than 100 municipalities above 90% in Italy in 2017, we like much more minimization of residual waste in kilograms per inhabitant and year because it blends the effects of both uh, waste reduction and separate collection and recycling, of course. And we have got uh, best practices around 20 kilograms per inhabitant and year at the moment. Uh, before the end, let me chime in very swiftly uh, with Ljubljana, because we don't have Joje, my friend Joje from Ljubljana today with us, but I will discuss very briefly Ljubljana and the case of Slovenia, which is becoming an intriguing case history, Slovenia. Ljubljana is basically the first national capital uh, which declared a zero waste commitment in Europe. That was back in 2014. This was at the grand opening at the town hall of the zero waste program. We were there with the mayor of Ljubljana, the chair of the parliament, and so on and so forth. And ever since the public waste management companies, Naga, has been promoting systems for both separate collection and for waste prevention. For instance, this is their uh, outstanding uh, uh, campaign against waste, uh, food wastage to raise awareness of how much how much food we waste and which may be preserved for human consumption or for um, pets or uh, be separated for uh, uh, recycling at the composting sites. Uh, this is the current situation in Ljubljana and the next commitments, they want to go up to 78 and then 80% by 2025 and 2035 and uh, fall down to 50 kilograms per person in year residual waste by 2035. So uh, this is turning Ljubljana and Slovenia as a whole into one of the playgrounds for zero waste strategies because of course the national capital in Slovenia is exerting a leadership in this respect that it's not the only zero waste municipality. We've got many more such as Vernica, Lox Dagomer, bled itself with a beautiful lake, it's a zero waste city. Uh, but if I may, if I may, uh, if you can see the Eurostat numbers, Slovenia is jumping on top of international rankings when it comes to separate collection and recycling. This was back in 2017. In 2018, Slovenia should have grabbed the first, uh, the top spots in the rankings above Germany. And as you can see, the reliance on incineration, which is the green part of the bars, is very small. So this keeps the system flexible and makes Slovenia to still bite into the residual reliance on landfilling, while uh, separate collection rates uh, have basically been stagnating in Nordic countries because they have to feed excess capacity with incinerators, uh, which is one of the key messages coming from the European Union right now with the uh, uh, latest uh, European communication on the role of waste to energy in circular economy dating back to January 2017. So, uh, best things come last. This is a comparison we always uh, uh, share with people to discuss the effect of zero waste in terms of minimization of landfills. On the one hand, we compare a typical Danish district producing some 780 kilograms per person in year municipal solid waste, 52% is incinerated, which makes a staggering amount of more than 400 kilograms per inhabitant in year uh, waste being incinerated. And this produces more than 100 kilograms per inhabitant in year slags and dishes. On the other hand, we have got a zero waste district, such as the province Treviso, with as little as 350 kilograms per person in year uh, municipal solid waste, 85% recycled, so residual waste is only as little as 50 kilograms per person in year, but flexibility of the system for uh, 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 the, the absence of incineration there, they can 
still commit to reduce residuals by a further 80% by 2023, going down to 10 kilograms per person in year. So basically, zero waste minimizes landfills as well. There's no need for incineration and in a comparatively short time, uh, even shorter than building an incinerator, you may really, really uh, minimize landfilling. Uh, also, never forget that zero waste programs do not imply an increase in costs. This was the effect of transformation towards the zero waste and curbside systems in the city of Treviso, the province capital. They, had, they went up to 85% separate collection. They reduced by a few euros per inhabitant in year uh, the cost which is transferred to taxpayers. But the icing on the cake was the increased amount of jobs. 26 more people working on sustainable waste management. And that's the best part in the system, I think. So thank you very much for your attention, but always be confident and always remember the only difference between utopia and reality is political will. You will do that. You will do that. Thank you very much. Amazing. Thanks so much, Enzo. That's great. Really um, informative and interesting <clears throat> examples as well. So yeah, we really appreciate you taking the time to run us through those examples. And we have a number of questions actually that we'll get straight to, um, if that's okay. And there are a couple, I'll group them together um, from Marianne and one from an anonymous attendee uh, talking about, yes, it's great. And as you mentioned, recycling rates have increased and the separate collection rates have increased in many countries. Specific, um, specifically in Italy and Viana, the examples that you mentioned. But what about waste um, sort of levels itself? Have these questions ask whether um, zero waste policies have actually led to a reduction in the amount, the volume of waste that's being generated? Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, um, basically, we we always detect a potential of reduction, which is. Uh, around between 10 and 20 percent right away. Uh, just the shift into curbside collection puts emphasis on the individual responsibility and above all it keeps off the system improper delivery of industrial waste in the big dumpsters. Uh, as, as long as you keep the dumpsters permanently on the roads you may, can make campaigns, you can exert as much control as you want on the system but uh, overnight there will be much industrial waste being delivered in the dumpsters. So Collection at the doorstep by itself tends to cut municipal solid waste by 20, 10 to 20%. Then there is a further effect of the waste reduction and prevention practices I mentioned. I touched briefly upon them uh, uh, during my presentation. Of course, I only discussed those ones who, which are in the remit of the municipalities because there's many more we may do uh, through industrial policy, for instance, promoting less packaging. This is far beyond the possibility of municipalities. But municipalities can start, for instance, promoting uh, uh, packaging-free shops. Uh, for instance, uh, through uh, codified uh, uh, taxation, uh, promoting uh, um, those activities which minimize waste. I mentioned uh, uh, home composting and community composting, even though Please be aware that in the near future, home and community composting will be counted as recycling in Europe and not as waste prevention anymore. This was the only way to keep together the potential effect of home composting and industrial composting. But then I said that the closed nappies, every baby produces, produces 5,000 nappies with the content inside, you know, the contents uh, in two years. And that's a staggering amount. It's uh, basically one ton in two years of life by, by a baby. Uh, so there's so much we may do with the reduction of uh, the use of uh, absorbent hygiene products in that respect. So that's it. Uh, the, normally, we calculate a further potential of reductions through such practices, which may be another 10 to 15%. So I would say, uh, the giant leap towards the zero waste comes with curbside collection, but then pay as you throw and reduction programs can typically halve uh, residual waste. So with uh, separate collection, you go up to 70, 80 percent 
and then through reduction and pay as you throw, you may go up to uh, 85, 90 percent separate, uh, separate collection and uh, minimize the uh, landfilling or incineration. Great, thanks, Enzo. Um, really interesting stuff. So the questions are coming through thick and fast. So we'll um, get started on the, the next uh, uh, couple. And the first one from Monica, which says that you mentioned rightly that the European Union, all cities within the European Union, will have to recycle and collect organics by 2023. But the question poses, what will happen to those cities who currently do not have the plants, the capacity to recycle it? Uh, are they simply obliged to find the plant elsewhere or sort of um, and what can cities really do um, between now and 2023 to ensure they have capacity, I suppose, to collect and recycle organics? Yeah, plenty of possibilities. Actually, I mentioned Milan. Uh, Ljubljana has got its own uh, organics processing sites. They have got a combined system, anaerobic digestion and composting in Ljubljana. It doesn't take long uh, to build it. So, you know, in two years, you may have your composting site up and running with proper planning, uh, a public tendering procedures, uh, um, uh, building it, uh, approving it because it has to undergo operational approval and so on and so forth. So it doesn't take so long as it would be with an incinerator. An incinerator typically takes a much longer time. But for the moment, uh, I was mentioning Milan. Milan, uh, for the moment, is generating 145,000 tons clean organics from separate collection of the organics. And it does not own a, a, an organics processing site yet. So for the moment, uh, they are shipping their organics to a private anaerobic digestion and composting site. But of course, plans are underway to build one or two. It may be more sensible to have two uh, differently located uh, composting sites, one north, one south of Milan, in order to serve different areas in the, in the city. But there are also different approaches. There's also comparatively big cities which had a consistent amount of organics uh, managed uh, through community composting and home composting. Zurich, Basel, Besançon, we have got the uh, case study uh, from Besançon, uh, which may be downloaded free of charge from the Zero Waste Europe uh, website. And normally, home can, and community composting do not have the same captures as a separate collection of the organics because it's a system based on voluntary particip participation. But uh, to start with, uh, it may do the job in the short term. And then in the longer term, you can plan your composting capacity. Wonderful. Thanks, Enzo. Um, and so, just I'm going to group these last set of questions for you, and then um, there are a number of other questions as well, but we'll come back to those at the end, um, just to say that. So, a couple of questions here around the separate collection systems for multi-material packaging and also non-recyclable plastics within a zero-waste city. Um, these are tricky materials that obviously, um, yeah, become increasingly sort of used in pack everyday packaging. So what can cities and what can citizens do as well to reduce these, these forms of waste? Yeah, indeed, this is a very good question. Um, multi-material collection first. Uh, this is becoming a problem uh, where multi-material collection is still much diffused. This is a typical problem in North American conditions. In the United States and Canada, multi-material collection is the typical approach to separate collection of packaging waste. Whereas in Europe, we tend to go with bespoke collection of different materials, glass on the one hand, uh, uh, plastics on the other hand, paper on the other hand, and this tends to generate a much better quality. Still, the problem is there with the so-called low-grade plastics, which are collected through uh, separate collection systems for plastics. Since China built the big wall, the new Chinese wall, uh, against the low-grade plastics, they they are still importing high-grade plastics, high-quality high plastics. But of course, they said, we do not want to become the dumping grounds for materials you can't recycle in Europe. But Europe is fully aware of that. And in the European Plastic Strategy, the European Commission themselves, they're not environmentalists, you know, they are basically conservative uh, political profiles, but they are fully aware of the intrinsic responsibilities coming from the circular economy agenda. And they said, if we discuss circular economy, we have to build the needed infrastructure here. So the way to address 
the hard to recycle plastics will be first and foremost stop producing it this is the key message coming from the single use plastics directive for instance uh, secondly improve the recycling infrastructure and there are already technologies there they are randomly adopted across europe also to recover the low grade plastics instead of sending them to Asia or to a landfill or to an incinerator. Through densification and extrusion, you can turn them into durable materials and goods. It's downcycling. We do not like it as upcycling. It's plan B, but still way better than plan Z, which is incineration and landfills. So you can consider downcycling. But first and foremost, the mid and long term roadmap will be phasing out the production of the hard to recycle plastics. Thanks so much, Enzo. Really great. And um, yeah, so what we're going to do is we're just going to move on now to our second panelist. Thank you very much, Enzo. But guys, please do keep your questions coming in. And we have acknowledged the ones that you've already sent in as well. And we'll um, come back to those uh, after Sarah's presentation towards the end of the webinar. And just to, to reiterate again, um, both, both presentations will share via email um, after the webinar in the next couple of days. So yeah, if you have questions on the specifics um, regarding what was in Enzo's presentation or what will be in Sarah's, you will have these via email, so don't, don't worry. And again, the information that Enzo has mentioned on, on Libyana, on um, Contadina, Caponori, um, we have these case studies of best practices on our Zero Waste Cities website, um, which we can, the link is on the chat box, but we can share, of course, again. Um, and also we have lots more information on the Zero Waste Europe website, such as the unfolding of the, the SUP, the Single Use Plastics Directive, um, if you want to know exactly what that means for local municipalities. So um, I will hand the floor now to Sarah O'Coral. Oh, Carol, sorry, for the Network Manager for Institutions, Governments and Cities um, at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. I'm really excited to have Sarah today. Sarah holds a BSc in Engineering and Chemical Engineering from the University of Cape Town. She's an experienced manager where, with lots of experience working in the green and circular economy. In particular, she's extremely passionate about job creation and the development of sustainable cities in Africa. Cities that are really low carbon, resource efficient, and socially inclusive as well. Um, so, Enzo, I ask that you, uh, if that's okay, to stop sharing your screen, and hopefully we can use um, and see Sarah's presentation now as well. So, um, yeah, Sarah, I will hand the floor over to you. Perfect. Sorry, everyone. No problem, Sarah. That's, yeah, perfect. Be... I think I, I stopped right away sharing my, my desktop. Yeah. Right. Is go it go working? Sarah. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as, as Jack said, I'm the Governments and Cities Network Manager at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Um, I'm also happy to take kind of questions and discussions offline after after the webinar and um, if you'd if you'd like to do that um, we spoke a lot about uh, in that biography that I am I'm from Cape Town and I'm passionate about the circular economy developing in Africa um, but my work at the moment is very much based um, in Europe and, and North America and so that's where I'll, I'll focus um, my examples um, but maybe the, a good place to start is if the circular economy can happen in Africa, surely it can happen in Europe as well. Um, and you'll hear me today uh, talk a lot about circular economy. Uh, zero waste is, is part of the circular economy, so I'm not going to talk about zero waste cities as much as circular cities. Um, so, yeah, just to, to start right there. And uh, I'm going to focus on three key points today. Um, Really, I want to say that we need to focus our activities and efforts on upstream activities, which we'll talk about later. Um, that the circular economy is a tool for cities to meet a variety of policy objectives, including zero waste. Um, and that policymakers have a key role to play to accelerate the transition to zero waste cities, to circular cities. Um, 
Enzo's uh, presentation focused a lot on practice. Um, you'll forgive me if I help us to zoom out a little bit and maybe focus on theories and frameworks a bit more. Um, and, and really what I want to, to kind of hit home with is really the role of, of policymakers and the kind of abundant tools um, that, that policymakers have to, to really accelerate um, these transitions. Um, so yeah, off, off we go. Um, so Enzo touched on this as well, so I'm not going to spend too much time here, but really what I want to say at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation is that we focus on transitioning this linear economy to that extracts natural resources to make products of which 90% become waste to a circular economy. And that circular economy is based on three principles. The first is designing out waste and pollution from the system, keeping products and materials in use for as long as possible at the highest value possible, and regenerating natural systems. Um, cities currently represent 75% of global resource consumption and account for 50% of global solid waste production. So we definitely need to focus efforts on developing, developing integrated high efficiency waste management systems so that we stop leakage into the environment. Um, but we also really need to focus our attention on solving the real problem, not just the symptoms of it. Um, and, and so therefore the three key priorities for zero waste cities should be designing waste and pollution out of that system, keeping products and materials in use and maintaining their value, and regenerating natural systems in and around cities. Um, in terms of things currently making it difficult, um, based on the research that we've done analyzing circular economy development in cities, um, and specifically the role of policymakers. These are uh, four key barriers that we've identified. The first is general lack of awareness and understanding of the circular economy. Um, we've recently launched a learning hub in July. That's a free resource uh, to anyone that uh, wants to do self-paced learning on the circular economy. And it covers everything from an introduction to circular economy to circular economy and cities specifically. We're also in the process of developing a deep dive for that learning hub called Train the Trainer um, that will be able to assist you and others to, to train people on what the circular economy means in practice. And that's expected to be released uh, later in the year or, or early next year, depending on how quickly the team can push that out. So really we find this lack of awareness and understanding of what the circular economy means in practice being a barrier um, just kind of stopping um, people moving forward. But there really are lots of tools, not only and resources, not only on the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, um, but from organizations like Zero Waste um, Europe as well to really help, help you move forward. Um, the second uh, one is we see lots of government departments working in silos. The circular economy is transversal in nature and it needs collaboration by several government departments and then also with industry, civil society, and ac academia for it to really work and for it to accelerate. We see those cities that create transversal working groups or stakeholder groups um, uh, really finding their acceleration um, moving much, much quicker because they create the space for circular economy to happen um, and, and, and partnerships between stakeholders that otherwise wouldn't ordinarily uh, talk to one another happens um, from those working groups. The next is uh, complex regulatory frameworks. Enzo spoke a lot about regulation and policy um, in his chat. Um, and actually we find that at the city level because cities are governed not only by their city bylaws, but also by regional regulation and national regulation, that it, this can make uh, regulation itself really difficult uh, for business um, and for entrepreneurs to navigate, which stops entrepreneurs 
and, and business moving forward with uh, zero waste and circular economy strategies. And so toolkits that can navigate policy um, can be extremely useful, not only to, to industry, but also in many cases to policymakers as well. Um, and then also in some case, we really not need to look at reform um, for in, in terms of regulation. We have outdated regulation that needs to be updated as we move towards zero waste and, and circular economy um, and to make sure that different pieces of, of policy and regulation speak to one another um, when we're talking about the this, a zero waste commitment um, or, or a circular economy transition. Um, and then finally, this is probably uh, the most key one uh, that I'd, I'd like to, to really everyone to take home out of this presentation. Um, probably one of the most important barriers that we see is that people tend to think that circular economy is another objective for a city to meet. And actually, in fact, we see the circular economy at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation being a critical tool um, and in fact, in many cases, a success factor towards meeting many policy objectives. Um, and so I'll just pause here on the slide for a moment um, to say that in, uh, we published this, this piece of work in April specifically on circular economy in cities. Um, and we found that the circular economy can help to meet a variety of uh, city policy objectives, including enhanced economic activity, um, creating jobs and safeguarding jobs, decreasing greenhouse gas emissions, and reducing the need for new products by keeping products in use for longer. So as well as supporting the delivery um, of multiple sustainable development goals as well. Um, so the circular economy can help cities meet a variety of, of policy priorities and it supports the development of thriving, livable, resilient cities. Um, this piece of research that I, that I speak about um, also did deep dives into three urban systems across five key phases. Um, and within that, we discovered that policymakers are absolutely critical to the success of the circular economy. Um, business or civil society uh, cannot do it alone. As I said, we need to work in collaboration. Um, and yeah, we unpacked uh, these three urban systems specifically. You can find the fact sheets for buildings, mobility, and products um, on that Circular Economy in Cities webpage um, on the Ellen MacArthur uh, website. And we unpack those three urban systems across five phases, as I said. Uh, the first, and, and let me say again, this, this was all done in relation to, to policymakers and the role that policymakers play within these three urban systems. So these three phases are uh, planning urban structures, designing for people, uh, making global products locally, increasing access or improving access to products, and operating and maintaining products for reuse. Um, as I said, we've published these fact sheets. Everything um, on our website uh, is available. Um, it's all open source, so you can go and, and read up on that. They're very meaty documents, I warn you. Um, so be ready with a cup of tea or something when you go, go through with them, but packed, of, packed full of uh, really, really great examples from all around the world. Um, and within after studying those those urban systems and these different phases we identified five categories of policy levers uh, that are available to policymakers, um, and they are vision engagement urban management economic incentives and regulation all of these policy levers as you can see from the diagram are very much interlinked and there's no one silver bullet. So the cities that we've studied use a combination of these policy levers to, to reach their circular economy goals, but they don't necessarily use the same set of levers for that. Um, and I think here it's also really important to take a moment to, to really uh, notice that policy levers are not only 
economic incentives and regulation, which I think would be the two policy levers that would usually come to mind when we talk about policymakers. Um, and when we when we move towards zero waste cities and, and circular economies, but uh, vision, um, engagement and urban management are also really critical uh, policy levers. Um, and so in the time that I have left, I'm just going to spend some time unpacking uh, these policy policy levers. Um, and some of what I speak about uh, will resonate with Enzo's presentation a lot. Um, so hopefully it doesn't sound repetitive. Hopefully it just kind of buckets things um, to help us understand uh, some of where the examples that Enzo spoke about fit into in terms of these policy levers. Um, so first of all, setting a vision. Roadmaps and strategies can provide overarching direction for a city and inform the development of other policy levers, such as earning, uh, urban planning standards or material and waste classification regulations. Um, engaging urban stakeholders in the development of these roadmaps also often strengthen its effectiveness because of a sense of shared ownership. Key success criteria that we've identified in terms of developing roadmaps and strategies um, are that these roadmaps and strategies prioritize specific sectors for intervention, they're co-developed with a wide range of stakeholders, and they identify indicators and metrics for success. So that's also something that Enzo spoke about. Um, and we see an increasing number of national and circular economy roadmaps um, and policy strategies emerging around the world. Um, at, a, at a national level, but also very much at, at a city level. Um, the next set of policy levers relate to engagement. Um, so governments have a unique ability to engage with multiple stakeholders uh, from across sectors to catalyze action. Harnessing circular economy opportunities requires understanding, collaboration, and action within and between sectors. So these engagement policy levers can raise awareness of circular economy opportunities that have been identified and to strengthen the capacity of others to seize them, such as capacity building programs for SMEs or skills training programs. Convening and engaging with stakeholders in a variety of ways can also support the design and application of other policy levers, as I said, such as creating a sense of uh, shared ownership over the roadmap, working with businesses to identify specific regulatory barriers in the city. Um, and I also alluded to this earlier that convening uh, these stakeholders often leads to collaborations and partnerships that might not otherwise have emerged. Um, across all the case studies that we've analyzed, uh, they all have this policy lever group in common. Um, so a key success factor to each of the case studies uh, that, that we have researched um, is convening and partnering, awareness raising, and or capacity building activities. This is a soft set of policy levers that bring people together to, to around a collective goal um, to, to collaborate and really are the foundations, we think, of, of the success of a circular economy transition. The next uh, group is urban management. So city governments have a strong influence over the physical development of a city and as well as the procurement um, and management of its assets and as well as uh, the procurement and management of assets uh, for the public. So these policy levers are urban planning, asset management, and public procurement, and each relates strongly to the choice, uh, design, use, and flow of materials in a city, uh, making them key to the transition to a circular economy. They also relate strongly to one another, and the way in which land use in a city is planned has a strong influence on how its assets and that land can be managed. Circular asset management practices can inform public procurement standards as well and vice versa. Um, as with other levers, urban management levers are not self-contained and can be guided by circular economy strategies and regulation and involve a lot of collaboration between government departments in particular to make this uh, set of 
urban uh, management policy levers work. Um, and they usually benefit from economic incentives. Um, so economic incentives along with regulation are probably one of the most common set of policy levers that we think about when it comes to mind uh, about what policymakers can do. Financial support and fiscal measures can both incentivize circular economy activities. Financial support can help foster innovation and new markets and fiscal measures um, like taxes, uh, penalties and charges can incentivize or discourage behaviors. And the degree of autonomies that cities have varies greatly. Um, and these uh, levers are often developed with higher tiers of government. But I will say here that um, we have found that a significant number of, of cities uh, really do have a uh, pull when it comes to developing um, new, new, new regulations and also uh, setting in, in place new bylaws themselves uh, for a vision um, that they want to see. Um, in fact, 57 of public investment is at the local or regional level. Um, and although regional variances um, are significant, I think that's a really important number. Um, and we've also seen tax reductions um, put into place to uh, introduce or re, um, re incentivize sharing, recycling, or repair activities. And then finally, regulation, most common of all policy levers. Um, and really, this is a core domain of government, particularly at national level. Um, but we found, as I said in the previous slide, 25% of metropolitan governance bodies can impose binding regulations, and they play an important role in shaping markets, influencing behavior, and removing barriers. They can also reinforce and support other levers, um, like regulations regarding housing density or affordability linking to urban planning decisions. So policymakers can play a role in shaping bylaws that stimulate circular economy practices, reviewing and updating existing bylaws. Um, that speaks to something that I said earlier about regulatory reform being needed to be able to advance um, this new economy. Um, and they can also use bans to prohibit the circulation of linear goods. Um, so I will, I will stop there and take some, some questions and hopefully uh, that will provide an opportunity to talk about some case study examples um, in particular. Great, <clears throat> sorry. Thanks so much, Sarah. That's really uh, interesting and useful and I think complements Enzo's presentations really well. So um, thank you so much. And as you mentioned, that was a exciting opportunity to open it up to the floor and to have questions from everyone else here. And we have a number of questions already lined up, but um, yeah, to everyone listening in and participating, please do remember to send questions that you might have through the Q&A uh, box at the bottom of the screen there. So Sarah, this one is specifically um, mentioned for you and then we'll open up and bring Enzo back in. Uh, this is from Ant Igbokan. Um, and it, for you, Sarah, and how do we, how do you think we can overcome the established systems um, where so many people, so many companies, businesses, uh, decision makers, usually um, have like a vested interest in keeping the current status quo, this linear system. And so examples that Anna's mentioned here is the oil giants continuing to make plastic for single use packaging, councils that are committed to send a certain amount of volume for landfill incineration and the, the need for companies to continue to sell new phones, new cars, etc. So yeah, a, a question, quite a, um, a sort of a, a tough question for you, Sarah, but uh, yeah, how do you think we can, cities and, and citizens themselves can help overcome um, the sort of the status quo at the moment? I think uh, the, w the first thing to say there is uh, working at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, uh, I think I'm lucky in the sense that I see the things that uh, big business is doing all the time uh, to work towards uh, zero waste and, and the circular economy and the commitments that they've made. So you could take uh, the new plastics economy global commitment as an example of that, that we have 
governments and businesses around the world committed to a new plastics economy, um, an economy uh, that phases out problematic and unnecessary uh, plastic items, that where reuse is prioritized, where 100% of plastic on the market is reusable, recyclable, compostable in some form, um, and where we decouple this, the finite use of resources like oil um, from our economy. So I think uh, just thinking about the, the global commitment and the fact that so many governments and businesses have signed up to a commitment which is not just saying uh, I'm going to reduce my uh, plastic in my company by 50% or, or something like that, but it's, it's a commitment where they promise to measure their progress over time. And I think that's, that's what's really important. Um, and, and we're seeing at the moment as we move to a new global commitment uh, progress report that companies and governments are making progress towards that. I think um, also as part of that question, I think, um, and things that you alluded to, like uh, send, still having commitments to send waste to landfill and still being dependent on these resources, is that uh, I think we need to remember that we're working with a global complex system. Uh, we were talking about this the other day at work where we have been building this linear economy uh, for about a hundred years um, and we're trying to make a shift within a matter of a few decades um, and so I think it's it's important to remember that these things uh, don't just shift automatically over time I think Enzo's example of uh, the municipality uh, that uh, increased its uh, recycling rates by 40 percent in a matter of three months is also something important to remember that once you once you have a vision once you set a goal and you start to take action that's in some cases uh, these things can start to move move quite quickly but i think we need to remember that we're working with a really big machine with many many parts um and it is going to take time to shift that but we definitely are starting to see um shifts i know that unilever has also put out a big plastics uh, commitment this year um, and then finally, in terms of uh, the current system um, and companies needing to sell more and more products to be able to maintain revenue schemes, I think this is where we see the product as a service model becoming increasingly important. Um, so where we don't own products, we rent them, we lease them, um, and companies uh, maintain ownership over those products. Um, like uh i'm gonna forget the name now oh the carpet example uh deso carpets um where uh carpets are are leased um to buildings um and deso is maintains ownership over those carpets uh they replace the carpets after a number of years um and the carpet fiber is used to produce new carpet again um, so I think we, we start to see uh, these models becoming increasingly important. Um, and I think uh, we'll start to, we're starting to see it more and more um, in the consumer kind of household space, the everyday space as well. Um, there's that really great example of um, the Danish company uh, where they uh, lease baby clothes. So speaking again to another one of Enzo's examples where uh, babies grow so quickly um, and they um, and they they use clothes uh, so quickly, but also when we when we think about babies, we're often very conscious about the materials uh, used, um, and and so we do see these these product models where you you rent uh, baby clothes instead of um, having to purchase an item that your child is only going to use maybe for two months before they they outgrow it. Um, and in that product model as well, repair is really important. So the company repairs uh, clothes um, so that they can be used again. Uh, so yeah, reuse, repair and refurbishment, I think we'll start to see uh, becoming increasingly kind of dominant as well as uh, product as a service model models. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks, Sarah. Um, yeah, I think you touched on the real key cornerstones of the circular economy, reuse, repair, redesign. Um, those factors are as critical for, for cities and, and for individuals as well. So thank you. And um, the next question I'll propose to you first, and then we'll bring Enzo in 
afterwards, because I think there are examples from both you can provide here. We had a couple of questions on whether the circular economy zero waste um, approach can be adapted and adopted in on islands, and specifically the challenge, you know, the individual um, challenges that islands face, the importation of a lot of products and packaging that ultimately goes to waste. But then also broadly, there was a question on zero waste and circular economy in, in developing countries. And um, maybe Sarah, with your, your work at the MacArthur Foundation um, to discuss maybe specific challenges and approaches that have been successful in, in countries outside of Europe. Um, and Enzo, to bring in after perhaps our examples from uh, our, our sister partners of Gaia perhaps too. So um, yeah, Sarah, I'll pass the floor to you first, if that's okay. Cool. Um, we, we definitely, this is definitely possible in, in island states. I think we could say that actually it's imperative for island states because of their proximity to the ocean that we need to you know, rapidly stop leakage um, from the environment and zero waste is absolutely critical to that, just like the circular economy. But I think, uh, to keep my answer short here, I think it really speaks to the need to design out materials from the system that are problematic um, so that those island states don't have to deal with them. I think at the moment we see with these problematic materials that incineration or chemical recycling are kind of really the only options um, along with landfill for those. Um, and they're uh, usually really expensive um, and they require large economies of scale for them to work, um, which makes that really, really difficult for an island state. Um, and so, yeah, I think that this is definitely a case where we, we need to talk about uh, why why those materials are on the market uh, to begin with, um, and I think their uh, like eco design policies and uh, extended producer responsibility are absolutely critical as well to make that work. Um, and in terms of developing economies, uh, we have a lot of work at the moment going on in Latin America and China um, at the foundation. Um, and we're also starting to, to increase our, our work in Africa um, over time. Um, the African Circular Economy Network is alive and kicking. Um, that's a group of practitioners who come together to talk about circular economy development in Africa. So it's happening in Africa. It's happening. We see it happening in Southeast Asia. We see it happening in Latin America as well. Um, and if you look for those examples online, um, you'll find them as well. Um, so um, there's a, a lovely example actually that I'll take the time to share now since I have the floor um, uh, about uh, Belo Horizonte in, in Brazil. It's a city um, and the city there has worked to develop uh, IT equipment refurbishing um, and repair. Um, basically the, the city works to uh, refurbish uh, computer equipment they do that by providing people uh, with the skills development opportunity. So they have these kind of repair hubs and the repaired uh, computer and IT equipment goes into uh, like computer uh, cafes or, or libraries uh, for the public to be able to access uh, that equipment, uh, which otherwise might be uh, too expensive for them to be able to access on a, on a day to day basis. Um, so I think that's a really nice example in a in a developing country of the circular economy at work for public benefit. Um, that yeah provides a skills development opportunity and and keeps uh, electronic equipment in use uh, for 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 as long as possible. Great, thanks, Sarah. That's really really useful and interesting. And just to say, um, we have shared some of the links to the documents that you've mentioned here, the Belo Horizonte case study. Uh, the carbon leasing project which you mentioned before in the presentation as well so they're just in the chat box should um should uh, attendees want to click on that and find out more information and enzo i'll pass uh, the floor to you to discuss those questions around zero waste circular economy being practically adopted in developing economies and island states as well yeah, thanks. Um, I already shared uh, a few replies in written in the Q&A box. Anyway, for the benefit of the, of the wider audience, 
Certainly, circular economy is becoming a buzzword everywhere around the world because, you know, it's not just the homage to the environmentalist uh, mindset. It is a web, it is a, a, the best way to, um, to, to cause efficiency in the production system because on the one hand, you will extract uh, less primary raw materials. On the other hand, you will reduce uh, the need for disposal and this implies savings. Uh, circular economy and zero waste, uh, they were formerly used for in the industrial sector in order to maximize efficiency in the industrial production by Toyota, Xerox, uh, many, many big uh, corporate uh, industries. However, uh, if we discuss more in specific zero waste programs, yeah, in, in Southern Eastern Asia, there's plenty. Some are in their early steps. Above all, I think uh, that uh, most mature situations are in the Philippines. For instance, I mentioned in the chat box uh, the city of San Fernando, which totals a population of 300,000 people, and they are at 80% separate collection. Of course, in those situations, there is a pivotal importance of decentralized management of organics because they can't wait for an industrial composting site to be built and run, and the informal recycling sector as well, which is also another, it, it gets another key message across about livelihoods that people can make out uh, of zero waste programs, and that's extremely important. Well, concerning islands, uh, uh, we, <laughs> We worked back in 2001 with the Minister of Environment over here in Italy because we have got quite a few small islands here, not as many as the Greek islands, but anyway, quite a high number. And uh, there is some evidence that in islands, uh, given the cost of shipping anything uh, to and from the mainland, uh, anything should be made circular, as circular as possible. So uh, one pivotal issue is, is uh, uh, on-site composting. In particular, uh, since normally the small islands do not have paper mills, you may consider co-composting paper and organics. So you would not need garden waste. As most of the islands are in tropical uh, uh, situations. So it, it, it doesn't make much sense to cut wood in order to have bulking agents for your composting processes, but paper and cardboard may be a perfect replacement for garden waste in that respect. Um, of course, uh, much relates to the procurement procedures. If you had to import food from mainland, of course, procurement has to pave its way to have it as uh, with as little packaging as possible, of course. So it's up to the local decision makers uh, to be to have a careful management of the procurement in that respect. Great, thank you, Enzo, and thank you, Sarah, for those responses. So we have um, about ten to fifteen minutes left uh, this webinar, so we'll just get through a couple of these last questions here that have been proposed, and um, one from Christina Saris here uh, around more waste um, examples of, of waste reduction initiatives and um yeah maybe uh sarah i'll come i'll come to you first for this if that's okay because um you mentioned the complexities that many countries and facebook well exist in many countries because the national regional local um sort of regular regulatory uh, environment uh for those on the call who work at the local level do you have any examples of, of successful local initiatives that have been um really impactful in reducing waste uh, the work that Ellen MacArthur Foundation does and also the same question to you Enzo afterwards but um yeah Sarah if you want to take a first go at answering that uh, I think you're on mute Sarah sorry let me unmute myself um I think a nice example here is Amsterdam working on its sharing economy um, so Amsterdam has set a sharing economy uh, vision um, and they developed this vision by working uh, in collaboration with a large group of stakeholders uh, to decide uh, what, um, yeah, what key kind of sharing economies were needed in the city. Um, I think what's interesting here as well is that they found that the sharing economy was particularly 
beneficial for older people um, for older population group um, as well, which I just think is was quite interesting. Um, and so they focused on um, three areas. The first was uh, is uh, renting household items uh, that you wouldn't use all the time, like tools. Um, the second one is uh, car sharing and motorbike sharing schemes. And the third one is about renting fashion instead of, of buying new fashion. Um, and there as well, they identified uh, all the different uh, municipal departments that needed to be involved. Um, and they worked with this large uh, stakeholder group so they could identify uh, where, if the, if the regulatory framework was complicated um, or if it was gonna be complicated to implement, that they were working with the right government departments to make it work. Um, I think we find this quite often is just because uh, the regulatory framework is can be difficult to navigate uh, that uh, talking to the municipality when you, when you have an idea or you're not sure how it's going to work in the absence of kind of a, a toolkit to navigate the framework um, is often often really useful and in Amsterdam setting up its uh, sharing economy um, they very actively uh, sort out uh, all the different government departments that would be needed to to make it work. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Really um, interesting. And yeah, the, the case from Amsterdam uh, has been linked in the in the chat as well for those wanting to find out further information. And um, so Enzo, as on top of the other questions I asked, there was another one um, that I think might fit in nicely here around uh, the definition of, of, of zero waste cities. And, in the wider sort of planning context and what powers cities have to, to really um, implement these policies on the ground, if you're happy to take on this as well. Yeah, this is of fundamental importance because as I stated uh, uh, during the early slides in my presentation, yeah, working with municipalities is just so terribly important. It is important because that's the perfect level at which zero waste strategies and programs may be implemented. Since uh, the municipalities may relate both to the political level in order to cause the change in the political framework and to make it possible, but also they can uh, implement educational programs promoting zero waste lifestyles, trigger new zero waste businesses, products as a service, packaging free shops, and so on and so forth. However, however, we are well aware of the fact that uh, uh, municipalities or any jurisdictional entity having jurisdictional powers to make decisions on uh, waste management. In some countries, it's not the municipality, it may be the district, the, the prefecture, the county, whatever. Uh, however, they are not almighty in this respect. They live in a political context, in a planning context, in a, an operational context. And for instance, when defining our, uh, there is a codified definition of zero waste municipalities, which is uh, peer reviewed and kept by the Zero Waste International Alliance. And there is an European one, which basically aligns with the uh, SWIA one. And when we were discussing in early stages what a zero waste municipality may be, of course, uh, some came up with a proposal, they have to uh, separate at least 90% or they have to minimize the residual waste below 10 kilograms. But this would have restricted considerably the population of zero waste municipalities, decreased the impact on policy making, and so it was basically uh, detrimental to further promotion of zero waste programs. Um, and still, if you say, okay, let's codify a zero waste municipality based on the achievements which have already been made, there is nothing like zero in real life. There is nothing like 100% like zero. Therefore, somebody may come up with, say, with saying, okay, but it's not zero. Always keep in mind then that when discussing zero waste, we say that zero waste is more the journey than the destination. So what matters in zero waste programs is the continued effort to work towards zero. Probably when saying waste, uh, uh, we should be, say, be saying wasting. So try to waste as little as possible given your operational context. So in European conditions, 
we ask for a formal commitment to keep improving day by day, week by week, month by month, and so on. Of course, there is a problem with those municipalities having legacy infrastructure, which requires residual waste, but some of our municipalities uh, can't uh, sidestep it because they are forced by local planning to use uh, such infrastructure. So we only ask them to commit verbally, in written, in public events, uh, to show evidence to the planning authorities that they can do less, uh, they can uh, uh, consider, uh, they can plan um, phasing out uh, heavy infrastructure such as incinerators in 10 years time or 15 years time. So what matters is walking the proper direction instead of what you have already achieved. Then of course the commitment is terribly important. So we have got a two level system. The first level is municipalities working towards zero waste, making a formal commitment. And the second level is the best practices achieving 80%, 90% or less than 50 kilograms per inhabitant in year residual waste or 20 kilograms per inhabitant in year residual waste. If I may, just one uh, very brief add-on. Um, uh, both me and Jack, we will go to Asia next week because there's gonna be a very big zero waste cities conference there. And this makes it uh, uh, evident how important zero waste is becoming also there in Asia. Uh, also, uh, uh, we, we, we plan working also with some of the networks of working on cleanups because we know that the cleanups are not sufficient to mend the problem. They are very good anyway to trash, uh, to, to fight the trash blindness. They need to make people aware of the problem. They are also very, very helpful to collect important information during the cleanups, the European Union, in order to define the dirty dozen of items covered by the single use plastics directive used the most frequently found items during the cleanups. But above all, you know, people taking part in the cleanups or people uh, continuously committed in organizing the cleanups, they have got a higher awareness on the need to implement sustainable waste management. So we want to move from the cleanups to what we call the keep it clean plans, how to implement a sustainable management strategy for resources and waste, which has to be circular economy and zero waste. Thanks, Enzo. Really interesting again. Yeah, really appreciate the full and comprehensive response. And so we have um, four and a half minutes left, and I'm going to be real uh, horrible here and pose some tough questions for you both and ask that you limit um, your response times to uh, 90 seconds to two minutes each, if that's okay. Um, and so we have questions from uh, Alexi, uh, here in the chat box, let me just get up to confirm. Alexi Sanchez, and she wants to know, maybe this is perhaps more for you, Enzo, but as John and Sarah around <coughs> how important kitchens are um, in homes and in, in, in small and big generators, practical levels for changing, and how can we help um, encourage changing of behaviors and habits within the kitchen itself? And then we also had other questions on, if a zero waste city has little incineration um, or waste energy, how are they making up the shortfall in energy production? So maybe um, you want to address the, the waste energy um, sort of discussion. And then also another topic, which I think maybe Sarah, you could discuss briefly is uh, the circular economy benefits that this brings to um, greenhouse gas reduction, greenhouse gas emissions and a reduction in those perhaps um, as well. So yeah, I'm not quite sure um who wants to jump in first out of here um but as i mentioned it's gonna be really horrible limit your answer times to two minutes each please that's okay um so two minutes each it, it means i have to do that uh, in a nutshell in a nutshell um in a nutshell uh well waste to energy we have rewarded it into waste of energy because you know the typical uh, energetic efficiency of incinerators in europe where the calorific value of municipal solid waste tends to be much higher than in developing countries because we have got less organics, but still an important amount of organics in, in our municipal solid waste. So the calorific value is higher, the energetic efficiency tends to be higher. 
but electricity only is 20% energetic efficiency. The only way to increase energetic efficiency is to use heat in district heating. But heat doesn't make sense in most of the developing worlds. And that's the problem with uh, waste to energy, which we reward into waste of energy. The best way probably to produce energy from waste is to consider anaerobic digestion from organics in most of the world. And that's the best way. And still you may consider recycling of paper, recycling of plastics, instead of burning them and uh, losing materials, which would be a leakage from circular economy. I'm not quite sure I understand it. It's an intriguing question, the one on kitchens. I know Alexis from uh, since a long time, uh, but I, I, I understand the address is the organics management in kitchens. And the, that being the case is spot on. I myself uh, uh, brought this up, the pivotal importance of organics. Indeed, those square meters are the most important in zero waste programs. This is why we get so much focused on uh, organics programs and the need to make the system as comfortable as possible. Uh, in particular, by using the vented kitchen caddies, which tend to make the system uh, user-friendly, tidy, comfortable. Uh, what is getting diffused in many cities in order to make it possible also in the densely populated areas is the use of the compostable bags. We are against the use of compostable plastics as a one-stop shop solution uh, for the plastic tide. They make no sense to replace all the packaging on the shelves. Uh, it, they are not made up to uh, degrade in the open environment. But they can make sense in applications tightly connected to separate collection of the organics, such as the compostable bags, which maximize capture and quality of the collected bio waste. There's plenty of evidence which is available if you want to have more, uh, or in, uh, in sustainable event management when reusable is not possible. For instance, some events in the countryside or finger food, street food, something like that. Thank you, Enzo. Wonderful as always. And Sarah, just last thoughts and responses from you. Yeah, um, I think uh, the, the first thing that I'd say is I completely agree with Enzo. In South Africa, we'd never dream of district heating. We only ever want like district cooling, which is just really expensive and not possible. Um, but I guess then uh, there, when we talk about the circular economy, the circular economy is built on renewable energy sources. Um, and so I'd say if we're not getting energy from, from waste, we should be getting it from the sun, uh, from the wind. Um, and anaerobic digestion is also a really great example there. Um, this is also a really good moment to plug uh, our climate change paper that we published uh, last month. Uh, so we published a paper that talks about the link between climate change and the circular economy. Um, and very quickly, that paper that yeah that paper focused on five key uh, material streams: food, steel, cement, plastic, and aluminium. And basically, what the paper uh, states um, and the the model shows um, that was built with um, we did this paper in conjunction with material economics um, is that converting to renewable energy alone only solves 55 percent of our greenhouse gas emission uh, problem um, and so there's a remaining 45 percent uh, in terms of greenhouse gases that we need to tackle and that's really built on how we make and use products and so if we look at those five material streams that I spoke about, the circular economy, uh, if the circular economy is implemented in those streams, uh, the circular economy could help to cut emissions by 45%. Um, and, and, and so I think that speaks a lot to how we grow food, uh, yeah, food waste prevention um, and designing uh, food that's products that are healthier um, with little residual waste. Uh, we do also, we're working on a circular kind of design guide for the food industry uh, that I expect will be published sometime uh, next year. That's kind of, we're just starting that work, which really tries to tackle that. How do we reduce uh, food waste um, at kind of at the kitchen level, um, leading to that example. Um, and and yeah, I, th I think that that paper is a really interesting read. Actually, there's a really nice executive summary uh, that gives you kind of the highlights quite quickly. Great. So yeah, just um, thank you guys so, so much. Uh, huge thank you to Enzo and to Sarah for your 
expertise, your information, the, the presentations as well. Um, yeah, I hope everyone listening in has enjoyed the conversation. Thank you all for, for giving up your time and for joining us today and submitting such engaging questions as well. Um, we hope you've enjoyed it and found it impactful and formative too around what, what we mean by a zero waste city and how the circular economy um, sort of plays into this. Uh, a couple of last things from us at Zero Waste Europe. Throughout the chat box, um, we've been posting links to the, to the points that the speakers have been making. So please do um, review this and use them if, you're, if you want to dig deeper into any of the topics um, that have been discussed here and raised. Uh, Sarah mentioned the topic of chemical recycling in the presentation, um, and that leads us on quite nicely to uh, the next webinar in our series here, um, which will be held on the 12th of November titled Chemical Recycling, what it is and does it fit into the circular economy? So uh, yeah, quite a nice segue there. Thank you very much, Sarah, for that. Um, we hope- That's not what I want to leave like the, my last <laughs> statement to be, but okay. No, exactly. There are a lot of issues and um, questions that need answering with so yeah. chemical recycling. So um, yeah, you can find the link to register for that on the zerowastecities.eu website, along with lots of other inf information around um, how to sign up to our newsletter, um, as well, those of you um, who are particularly interested, we are hosting a study tour uh, on the 9th to the 11th of December um, in some of the cities that Enzo has mentioned in, in Milan and Capilori. If you want to meet Enzo as well, do join us <laughs> there. Um, so, and again, the registration and more further information can be found on our website. So, yeah, just again, a huge thank you to our panelists, to our attendees for, for joining, for your questions. And um, yeah, wish you all a lovely day wherever you are in the world. Thank you very much.